All right, good morning and welcome back to those who have been here before and welcome to those who are new. So this morning, as we've been hit with some pretty devastating news, Ukraine, and uh, just want to start saying my heart goes out to those who are suffering. It's sort of difficult to put into words, but I'm particularly appreciating the things we have in common uh, rather than the things internationally that might feel more dividing. Um, so just with that, uh, I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, but today we have a presentation by Vital Nelson, Calibrating the EDI and Cambrian Transition, updates from the Kalahari and Southwest Laurentia. Um, so he'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll go to a our question discussion session, which has changed a little bit. We're gonna start by talking mostly about, um, or start by having questions that are pretty broad. And anybody who has more specific questions, maybe try to hold them till the end and we'll transition to a more um, more open format where people can just have discussion more openly with the speaker. And that'll really only be limited by the amount of time the speaker has and how many questions we have. Next week, we've got a talk by Itai Halavi, um, and uh, his, sorry, I haven't put his uh, title online yet, but he'll be talking on uh, oxygen isotopes in the Precambrian. The title, let's see, oh, I'm missing it. Too many tabs open on the computer. Here's his object. Uh, deep time records of seawater delta 18 and climate, the irony. So join for that next week. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and I will, uh, I'll introduce our speaker today. Uh, so Lyle Nelson is currently a PhD student, or, or a PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins University with Dr. Emma Smith. He completed his undergraduate degree at Harvard with Dr. Francis McDonald as his research advisor. Since, his re since this, his research has focused on the neoproterozoic and the Ediacaran Cambrian transition, covering a combination of sedimentology, paleontology, geochronology, and field geology. He's been an NSF graduate research fellow since 2019, and he plans to graduate in May of this year. And with no further introduction, please allow take it away. All right. Uh, Thank you. You're, yeah, can you're you unmuted. Okay, let me just turn on my uh, laser pointer. Great. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Alex, for that uh, introduction and for, for running this sem uh, seminar um, for the past year. It's been, you know, a highlight of, of, of my weeks. Um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to present today. So I'm going to be talking about some of the research that uh, colleagues and I have been doing to try to improve understanding uh, changes to Earth's surface environment that occurred across one of the fundamental geologic boundaries in Earth history. And so that is the Ediacaran Cambrian transition. And this type of integrated stratigraphic research is highly collaborative. So I have many folks to acknowledge for contributions. And here I've listed um, co-authors on the studies that I'll be highlighting today as well as critical funding and permitting organizations. And I'd particularly like to thank my PhD advisor, Emmy Smith, for uh, mentorship and support of this research. And in addition, I'm gonna show geochronology analyses from the labs of Jahan Ramazani and Mark Schmitz. So I thank them for these collaborations. Okay, so uh, the importance of the Cambrian has been recognized for a long time. And the Cambrian explosion of animal life um, is sometimes referred to as Darwin's dilemma. And this is because he recognized it as a potential challenge to his theory of evolution by natural selection, which he thought should be a very slow process. So I quote his chapter on the imperfection of the geologic record, which is an extremely fitting title. I allude to the manner in which many species in several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. The case at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. Now, Darwin thought that eventually a deeper route to the fossil record would be discovered, including 
ancestors of these Cambrian taxa. And of course, in a sense, he was right. And we now recognize that a significant number of macroscopic body fossil taxa show up in rocks of the Ediacaran period prior to the Cambrian. However, although many of these are thought to be examples of the earliest animals or metazoans, for the most part, these cannot be rigorously fit into modern phyla. So the Ediacaran biota is this enigmatic assemblage of uh, large morphologically complex eukaryotes that represent the first major radiation of multicellular life. Um, and so here's an artistic rendition of an Ediacaran seafloor. And the biological affinities of these organisms have been much debated. But recent work, including some um, recently presented within uh, various lectures of this seminar series, suggests that these are a mixture of stem and crown group animals, as well as um, perhaps some extinct higher order clades. And so with the exception of a few debated and isolated occurrences, these fossils disappear at the base of the Cambrian. And so we see this relatively consistent boundary in the rock record where Earth's surface transitions from a relatively unrecognizable biotic world in the Ediacaran. And then we cross the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary and all of these enigmatic creatures disappear. And then when within about 20, 30 million years in the basal Cambrian, about 90% of modern phyla appear in the fossil record. So the specific timing and drivers of this transition remain relatively poorly understood. And there are significant outstanding questions in geobiology. And you get folks arguing for both top-down and bottom-up style processes um, to explain some of these changes as uh, Nick Butterfield and others have eloquently discussed in, in previous seminars. And so I just wanna take a couple minutes to get the broader co um, context to the Ediacan Cambrian boundary, although it may not be necessary for this audience. Um, so here's the geologic time scale that's progressing from uh, 800 million years ago to 520 million years ago. And again, we're talking about this uh, red arrow here, uh, the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. And so based on molecular clock estimates, animals should have evolved around 800 million years ago, um, but the earliest fossil record is in the basal Ediacaran or maybe late cryogenian around 630 million years ago when there are these biomarkers preserved, which uh, Gordon Love discussed in the fall that are thought to be produced by sponges. And then about 570 million years ago, body fossils of these enigmatic uh, macroscopic Ediacra biota are first found in the record. And these belong to what has become known as the Avalon assemblage. The earliest probable bilaterians um, show up at about 550 to 560 million years ago. And then the appearance of complex burrowing behavior is what defines the base of the Cambrian. And then of course, to get fossils of uh, recognizable modern animal phyla to show up in the early Cambrian. So at the backdrop of this major biological innovation, there are these large climate perturbations. Um, so these periods of probable global glaciation during the Cryogenian, um, separated by intervals of greenhouse ice-free conditions. And in addition, the supercontinent Rodinia is breaking apart through widespread continental rifting. And Gondwana starts to assemble in the Ediacaran in the Pan-African origin. So in addition um, to, to these records, measurements of stable carbon isotope ratios of carbonate rocks and shales deposited during this interval indicate the largest perturbations in Earth history, which are linked to changes in the surface carbon cycle. Finally, significant rises in atmospheric oxygen have been proposed at various intervals in the Neoproterozoic um, based on a wide variety of proxy records and what has become known as the Neoproterozoic oxygenation event. However, the timing of oxygenation events, the number of oxygenation events, and the, the level of surface ocean oxygenation remains relatively poorly constrained. It also remains unclear how significant this actually was for evolution. So regardless, there are these broad potential correlations between a number of significant changes to Earth's surface environment. But how do we move from this to a more fundamental understanding of the behavior of Earth's system during this interval? And, uh, get to the mechanisms of these various potential top-down or bottom-up processes. And what becomes really key is temporal resolution because all of these different records come from different sedimentary strata around the world that need to be correlated and cal calibrated. And in many cases, uh, these are poorly correlated and poorly calibrated. So tied up in this question of timing is also how do we actually define major stratigraphic boundaries in the rock record? So how do we identify the base of the Cambrian? So this is important because the ability to identify this boundary in specific sections and to calibrate it globally is critical to understanding relationships 
relationships between environmental and evolutionary or ecological change, as well as the constraining rates of uh, relative timing of extinction and of diversification. So the base of the Cambrian is defined at Fortune Head, Newfoundland, where the golden spike is intended to coincide with the first appearance of the trace fossil of Tryptopnispedum, which is thought to be the first evidence of a bilaterian able to make complex burrows both horizontally and vertically. So this is the actual GSSP. But of course, Tryptopnus pedum is not found in every section. Um, and there may be some paleoenvironmental or taphonomic controls. In addition, there's no geochronology from that section at Fortune Head. So another way to recognize the boundary is the last appearance of the fossils of these soft-bodied Ediacara biota that I briefly discussed earlier. Because with a few debated exceptions, these seem to disappear um, from the stratigraphic record at the base of the Cambrian. In addition, there are these mineralized tubular um, cloud dynad fossils, which appear in the record around 550 million years ago, and then again, mostly disappear at the base of the Cambrian. And then in the early Cambrian, you get the appearance of these small shelly fossils, which are um, the earliest Cambrian body fossils, and they include recognizable phyla. It's important to note that um, both these groups, the cloud dynads and the small shelly fossils, have been um, suggested to, to cro actually cross the Ediac and Cambrian boundary. But there remains some uncertainty on this due to a lack of radioisotopic age control in these sections. So finally, a large negative carbon isotope excursion has been found in carbonate rocks stratigraphically associated with the first appearance of Tricticnus pedum in a number of sections. And this was first recognized in Northwest Canada and in Nevada. And therefore, this carbon isotope excursion has been used as a secondary marker for the Ediac and Cambrian boundary. And it's been uh, termed the base. And it gets down to values below minus 6 per mil. So quite a significant excursion. So just to make sure we are on the same page really quickly, um, the assumption behind using the base for correlation is that the carbon isotope values of marine carbonate rocks reflect the global dissolved inorganic carbon composition. And this is because of the timing of air-sea gas exchange and of oceanic mixing. So carbonate minerals then record the ratio of C13 to C12 of that dissolved inorganic carbon which primarily reflects global fluxes of burial and oxidation of organic carbon. So globally, if, you, um, if more organic matter is buried, you get positive excursions, and if more organic matter is oxidized, you get negative excursions. In addition, rapid release of light mantle carbon can also pull a lever here. OK, so we think that there are these broadly um, coeval evolutionary and geochemical changes across um, the Ediacaran and Cambrian boundary. They're loosely constrained, and we need to better understand how they fit together in relative frameworks, as well as absolute temporal framework. So there are serious challenges to doing this. Um, and here, and one, one of the big ones is that this boundary is often missing due to unconformities in the rock record. Uh, here in North America, in many places, this boundary falls within the so-called great unconformity um, related to the SOC transgression. In addition, uh, there are high uncertainties um, in correlation. So these different records come from different sections um, and it's fundamentally difficult to correlate them even along the same margin sometimes. And ultimately there are few sections with biostratigraphy, chemostratigraphy and radioisotopic geochronology that span the boundary to put together these integrated records. So the, the hypothesis that we're trying to test here is that basically the base or this large negative carbon isotope excursion is this globally synchronous um, perturbation to ocean chemistry at the Ediacaran human boundary. And that's coincident with biotic turnover. And so here's a paleogeographic reconstruction um, from Lee et al. 2013 from about the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. Um, and we're gonna probe two different records here, or look at two different records, one from Southwestern Laurentia and, and then records also from Southern Africa um, to, to try to look at this at two different paleocontinents to get a kind of a, a more global perspective. So we'll start in Southwestern North America. And so this is the distribution of uh, Neoproterozoic and early Paleozoic strata along the Cordilleran margin or the modern day Western margin of North America. And we're gonna start by uh, looking at these records here in Nevada and uh, California. 
So as I mentioned, these sections are one of the first places where this relationship between a large negative carbon isotope excursion and the first um, appearance of Triptychus pedum was actually recognized uh, by Corsetti and Hagedorn in 2000. Um, and so this is a, a, a mixed carbonate and siliciclastic shallow marine succession. And there is a large and expanded uh, negative carbon isotope anomaly here, values down below minus six per mil. And the last occurrences of Ediacaran type body fossils, including both Claudinomorphs uh, and Araneetomorphs, are below the nadir of this excursion. And then again, Triptychnus pedum shows up above this nadir of this excursion, defining the base of the Cambrian in this section. Okay, but there are no absolute ages from these sections. So let's look further south down the margin um, into across the border into Mexico. Because in Sonora, there are documented volcanic and volcanic clastic rocks that occur in the EDF and Cambrian interval. So there's geochronological potential in these sections, or maybe more geochronological potential at least. So this box interval are the strata that encompass the Ediac and Cambrian transition, um, the La Cienega formation and the Cerro Rojón formation. And this is what a section of these units look like in the field. So again, it's this mixed carbonate and siliciclastic units deposited in relatively shallow marine environments. Um, there are Ediac and body fossil horizons lower in the unit, um, Cambrian trace fossil horizons up near the top of the unit. And importantly, there are also these uh, basalt and volcanic plastic horizons. So here are a few measured parallel sections from the region, and there's a lot of detail here that you can ignore. Um, but here are the examples of some of the fossils. So there's these cloud dinids down low in the section, um, these tubular cast and mold fossils, and then up higher in the section, you just get these Cambrian style trace fossils with these complex furrowing behaviors. In addition, there's this large negative carbon isotope excursion with uh, values uh, down to below minus six per mil. And again, occurring above the cloud dynamic occurrences and below the lowest Cambrian trace fossil occurrences. And so at approximately the nadir of this excursion, uh, sandy dolestone bed yielded zircons that uh, Blake Hate Hodgen, um, who's currently at Berkeley, dated in Mark Schmitz's lab at Boise State. And so using the chemical abrasion ID Tim's method, six zircon fragments from the sample yielded a weighted mean age of 539.4 plus or minus 0 0.23 million years old. So this is a maximum depositional age, but perhaps was deposited shortly after eruption, given the proximal volcanic rocks in the section. And so this represents the first radiometric age constraint on the Eakron Cambrian boundary in Laurentia. So if we return to our hypothesis, um, the base is a globally synchronous perturbation to ocean chemistry at the Ediac and Cayman boundary and is coincident with biotic turnover. So our results, there's a negative carbon isotope excursion in Mexico that occurs at or younger than 539.4 MA. In Southwest Laurentia, there does appear to be biotic turnover across the base. And in Southwest Laurentia, this carbon isotope excursion is preserved laterally across hundreds of kilometer and coincides with the disappearance of Ediacaran fossils. Okay. So after that little whirlwind tour, let's turn our attention to Southern Africa and look at the Kalahari Craton. So this shows a map of uh, Southern Africa and the exposures of the Nama group. So this is the Ediacaran Cambrian units um, that were deposited in a uh, foreland basin uh, related to incipient collision between Rio de Plata and Kalahari. And a lot of the research that's been done on the NAMA has been in Namibia. And on one site in particular, um, has been the focus of many studies, particularly the paleontology site studies. And this is uh, Farm Swart Punt. And um, this is, this is uh, what Farm Swart Punt looks like. And these are some of the spectacular fossils that are preserved there. And this is a relatively famous section um, that many people are familiar with because of these spectacular fossils and this record of, the, of what's thought to be the Eakron Cambrian boundary. So there's a long history of work on the stratigraphy and the geochronology of the Nama group um, to understand the context of these fossils and, and the context of the late Eakron. And so really pioneering stratigraphic work on the, the depositional framework for these units, the tectonic setting, et cetera, was done by Gerard Herms and Peter Hresa. Um, for, for decades um, to, to, to really uh, establish these units as a, a really important record. Um, 
in the 90s, Beverly Saylor, John Grotzinger, uh, Sam Bowering, and others brought some new techniques such as carbon isotope chemostratigraphy and uh, uh, radioisotopic geochronology to these units um, that helped further refine this record and, and build an important uh, record of the, of the Lady Diacran and, and Basal Cambrian. And then much more recently, uh, the chemical abrasion technique um, was applied to these ash beds from Swart Pond. So Ulf Lindemann and Maria Ofcharava um, dated these with the chemical abrasion ID Tim's method, um, refining these dates from Grotzinger et al. 95. And so again, one of the reasons why so much attention is focused on this one particular locality is it's thought to record and calibrate the Akron Cambrian boundary. And that's based on this spectacular fossil record um, of including these arenetomorphs and these radioisotopic ages from a number of intercalated tuff beds. But there are some limitations to uh, the record at Swart Punt. One is that there's no negative carbon isotope excursion that um, can be considered correlative to the base that's documented in these rocks. Uh, there's limited extent of exposure, both laterally and vertically. This copy um, that we're looking at in the upper photo here is basically all there is. Um, of the upper units, at least, that are supposed to be the, the latest CD Akron to, to maybe, maybe basal Cambrian. And then there's this unconformity in these sections due to this uh, significant incised valley um, at the base of what's known as the Namstas Formation, which is, and most people consider the boundary to be actually within or, or at the base of this unconformity. So our strategy was to look along the margin at some potentially correlative rocks that had received much less attention. Um, so this is down south um, across the uh, Orange River, which is the border between Namibia and, and South Africa um, in an area known as the Ninth Napa Beep Plateau. And so here's some examples of the east-northeast um, virgin deformation um, in this area, which is a result of the creep origin. So we spent several field seasons mapping this area out because there was no detailed uh, map of this area that had stratigraphic subdivisions of the Nama group or documented these significant regional structures. And mapping was really critical in this area because there's lots of complicated structures, including these folds and both normal and reverse faults that have disrupted the strata, um, which we needed to reconstruct in order to get at the original depositional framework. Okay, so this is the first detailed geologic map of this area, about 300 square kilometers. And um, what this did is allow us to uh, measure a composite uh, stratigraphic section through the entire interval, um, which, uh, which gave a, a accurate record of the, of the NAMA group in this area. So once we parse out the structure and the units, uh, we can put together this composite section. Okay, so broadly, this is what the um, lithostratigraphy looks like for this section. So you can see this is 500 meters. This is a scale bar. Um, Celeste classic rocks are shown in brown colors. Carbonate rocks are shown in blue colors. And so this whole section is a little over a kilometer and a half thick. And so the broad stratigraphic architecture um, matches that of the Whitput subbasin in southern uh, Namibia and should perhaps be considered a continuation of this, um, where the, the lower part of the section is uh, uh, silicic clastic dominated, dominated um, and, and then the upper part of the section is uh, carbonate dominated. One of the key differences between this and the Whitput subbasin in southern Namibia is that, um, or at least the sections that are exposed of, of the upper part of the Schwarzerand subgroup, is that in this area, um, there isn't a valley incision associated with the transition from the Eurusis formation, so the stop, top of the Spitzkopf member, to the Namstas formation. So that there's no evident uh, valley incision here. Uh, rather, it looks like there's a transgression here into deeper water facies. So there's no clear unconformity in this section. So this uh, transgression is actually marked by these large scale pinnacle reefs um, that you can see here, and here we'll zoom in on them. And basically these are these uh, stromatolitic bioherms that are trying to uh, keep up with, with uh, the increase in water depth and then are eventually um, drowned out by the transgression and the influx of celestial plastic sediment. And what's happened here is that these overlying finer grained um, celestial plastic sediments that onlap onto these reefs have been eroded away. So we're left with this landscape 
um, that maintains the features of this Lady Diacrin seafloor. Um, so this is kind of a 3D exhumation of, of the seafloor and the, and the terminal Diacrin will look like here if we jumped off a boat and went snorkeling, which is, you know, spectacular rocks. So there's these flute casts. Again, there's no evidence of uh, wave base once we're going up into these siliciclastic units. So this all looks deep water, um, turbidite dominated uh, sedimentation. And this is an example of what this transition looks like at a, a smaller scale on a different fault block. So we get these microbial bioherms um, of the upper Spitzkopf and drowned out by siliciclastics. Um, and then you get these large uh, listlets form that are, are within the overlying siliciclastics that are probably forming as a result of um, gravity collapse due to flexion of the Foreland Basin, which is what's probably driving this transgression. Um, so there's these carbonate uh, listlets sliding, sliding from, from further up the margin. Should, you know, maybe in part where uh, derived from some of these sections where there's this large, uh, these uh, submarine valley incisions documented, such as Swart Punk. Okay, so um, there's these spectacular records of, of stromatolites and microbialites. And this is a little bit of an aside, um, but I just wanted to show some of these because they're, they're really beautiful. Um, you know, and we're talking about the macro scale in this talk, but uh, this is an example of some of the beautiful sedimentology in these sections that are similar to the, the Nama group elsewhere. Um, uh, yeah, some of these uh, different morphologies, these branching columnar stromatolites, these domals, these conicals, thrombolites, all these great textures. Um, and one thing that's really interesting about this area is that um, we can look at uh, the, the same stratigraphic positions at, at uh, different um, fault blocks um, that have different proximity to the margin. And what we seem to see is these uh, lateral changes in stromatolite reef morphology that are potentially um, associated with this differential lithospheric flexure. So different, slightly different environments, uh, different siliciclastic input, different accommodation space. Um, so this is a, a, a cool uh, research direction forward. So getting back to the broader scale stratigraphy of the basin, the most remarkable part about this section is that uh, there are dozens of volcanic ash horizons that are interlayered with the sediments. And this is because the sediments were deposited within this active foreland basin downwind of a volcanic arc complex. Okay, so this is what these ashes look like. Um, they're intercalated with these carbonate rocks. Uh, and so it's possible to tie these other records, so the geochemical records, um, to these absolute radiometric ages. And the tufts are solidified, so they weather out into these uh, blocky orange debris slopes. So they're pretty easy to, to identify and to find. Um, and even before the advent of modern day geochronology, people found uses for these tufts. So in the middle stone age, 40,000 years ago, um, early our early ancestors were using these to make hand axes. Um, here's some of the uh, later stone age uh, petroglyphs in this area. This is really cool because you can see these uh, striations. These are from the Dwight glaciation. So it's a, a striated surface of um, 539 million year old limestone that then has these petroglyphs on it. Okay, so we use mineral separation techniques to extract zircon from these ash beds. And then in Jahan Ramazani's lab at MIT, we use chemical abrasion, isotope dilution, thermal ionization, mass spectrometry um, to determine the uranium and lead isotope ratios in these zircon. And then a weighted mean analysis of uh, several of these zircon dates gives us kind of corruption age at relatively high precision. So we've obtained six new uranium lead dates um, on zircon for this section. These are marked in yellow circles on the stratigraphic column here. Um, and with this, we're able to develop a high resolution age model for these strata. So this is a Bayesian age depth model where the age for those that are familiar with these, the age is in millions of years ago. It's the x-axis here. And the stratigraphic height is in the y-axis matching up to these uh, different atch beds here. And so each of these histograms is the weighted mean um, age of a single ash bed. And so this model is created by taking random walks up the stratigraphic section that follow the law of superposition. So um, you have to get younger up section. And then you also have to follow the age control. So you have to fall within these histograms. And so these random walks are repeated hundreds of thousands of times by, by the 
our good old friends, the computer. And then we get the average of these walks and it's a 95% confidence interval is shown in blue here. And what this does is it allows us to have a probabilistic estimate of age, um, not just places where we have an actual ash bed, but in these zones in between the dated ashes. And so what we can do is reserve, uh, resolve this uh, you know, 3 million year interval uh, it's something like 100,000 year resolution. And so this high precision rate um, age depth model becomes really important because these rocks host a spectacular fossil record. Um, so this includes the first examples of Ediacara type biota reported from South Africa on um, these Ernietta morphs, some reconstructions, artistic reconstructions of what some of these look like. In addition, um, there's uh, several horizons that preserved calcified fossils, um, such as Claudina and Namacolophis, uh, including some that have been replaced by iron oxide, so were presumably originally pyrotized. Again, a reconstruction of what some of these uh, later Ediacaran organisms look like. And then there's a great trace fossil record as well. So there's these lower in the section, we see a relatively simple Bergeria type um, plugs and these bed planar fossils that are uh, burrows that are maybe Planolites or Helminthopsis. And then higher up in the section, there's a lot of much more complex and large burrows. Um, so there is these ones that um, have meniscate uh, lamina that uh, demonstrate these active backfilling behavior. Um, there's these ones that have these irregular con uh, constrictions that um, are evidence of peristaltic movement. Um, and then there's these bilobate ones. And the, the, a lot of these are really, really quite large. Um, that's a, I think that's interesting. Uh, so the point is anyways, that there's this really nice diversity of both body and trace fossils with different preservation um, and collaborators and I are working on a lot of the details of these. Um, but what's really cool is that we can really calibrate them with this uh, high resolution temporal framework um, to create this nice biostratigraphic record. So an example of how we can do this, so here's this um, Parasamachnides, this complex uh, burrow with uh, active backfilling behavior. So this is the first place with a star where it shows up in the section. And so we can uh, look at our Bayesian age depth model, and then we get an FAD for this fossil um, with an uncertainty. So this is the utility here. And so then we can look at um, a bunch of our other important biostratigraphic occurrences and develop this, uh, this biostratigraphy of FADs and LIDs within this, the same section that these ash beds come from, which is really important. This is a really excellent uh, locality to develop high resolution biostratigraphy of this interval. And this is kind of what this looks like from our recent publication. So we have the youngest radioisotopically cal calibrated occurrences of uh, Ediacaran type fossils, such as Ernietta morphs and Claudina morphs. Um, Importantly, we have not yet identified Triptychnus pedum in this section. So where, while there are these uh, examples of these relatively complex uh, trace fossil behaviors, Triptychnus pedum does not appear in this section. Um, so perhaps it's actually younger than 538 million years old on the top of the section here, or maybe uh, eventually some paleontologists will, will, will find it in this section. So we can actually place the base of the, the biostratigraphically defined base of the, the Cambrian in this section. Okay, so if we go back to our hypothesis, it was about the base. So it was about this carbon isotope excursion being a globally synchronous perturbation to ocean chemistry, um, coincident with this biotic turnover. Okay, so here's the carbon isotope record from this section. Um, and what you can see is that it's a bit of scatter, um, but for the most part, um, the entire record is positive. Um, what I would say about most of these negative points is if you uh, look at high resolution at this interval, um, they're outliers. So the majority of the section will be quite positive, and then you'll have uh, one negative point. And it's generally associated with siliciclastic material, um, so more silty carbonate. So our guess is that it's probably organic carbon mineral remineralization. This is also shown in the carbon and oxygen isotope cross plot that there's something going on with these um, data points. So we can compare our data. Um, from our chemostratigraph data from South Africa to the data I showed earlier from Mexico to sort of think about testing uh, the global synchronicity of geochemical data sets. Because um, you know, the age, while it is a maximum depositional age for Mexico, does overlap with this interval. And so this is the MDA um, plotted 
to this uh, 539.4 age from Mexico. And this is how it lines up with our age depth model. So it would correlate with uh, these data points here. And what you can see is all these data points are positive. So there's no negative excursion here. So maybe EDAC and cumin carbonates from Mexico and South Africa are recording um, different carbon isotope values for the same interval of time. One thing I want to highlight is that if we look at um, average sedimentation rates through this interval, they're really fast. So it's something like uh, half a meter, a meter every thousand years, something on that order, which are you know fast sedimentation rates. So I would suggest it's highly unlikely that there's a large carbon isotope excursion missing within um, a hiatus or, or unconformity or one of these uh, siliciclastic intervals. So again, we can uh, look at these compiled age constraints on the base. These are you know, all the places globally where there's uh, age constraints and uh, carbon isotope records um, uh, for, for this kind of broad interval across EDF and Cambrian boundary. Um, so there's a state from Oman that's right at the base of what, look, what um, is this large carbon isotope excursion. Uh, that's the first thing that was really used to, to calibrate the boundary. Uh, or at least the boundary as defined by the excursion. Um, this is again where, where uh, the data from Mexico fits in. And this is how far that record from uh, South Africa goes. So extends up to 538, no negative excursion. So I think there's a, um, different possible interpretations for this. One of these is that some of these ED Akron Cambrian carbonate platforms are preserving uh, uh, local delta C13 values rather than global marine values. And I think a lot more work will be needed to kind of suss this out. I think our preferred interpretation at the moment, or my preferred interpretation, I won't speak for all my co-authors, is that uh, the uranium lead ages from Oman and Caborca, Mexico are significantly older than the preserved excursions in those sections. Um, and so the EDI Cambrian boundary in the base is actually younger than 538 million years old. And I just wanted to um, briefly highlight this paper, which came out last month. And uh, the authors did a really nice job in this paper of, um, uh, of compiling a lot of chemostratigraphic data sets from around the world and attempting to come up with uh, correlative frameworks that fit the data. And there's a lot of information um, that I won't go into in these data sets, but I want to highlight that one of their models, this model C correlation, does place the the base excursion, so the negative carbon isotope excursion associated with the boundary at 536 MA, so younger than 538 MA, as, as we suggest here. But really the important point here is this, this, is, this record is really poorly constrained. So uh, all the uranium lead isotope um, uh, geochronology data that constrains this record, that's all these stars here. And what you can see is that from the, the, nom the record from the NAMA group, the ages from the NAMA group, all the way up to about 530 MA, there's just really limited constraints in here actually um, pinning this record. Uh, so the, you know, it's almost a 10 million year interval. So I think it'll take a lot more data in this interval to see if changes are, are precisely globally correlative and also determine when exactly they're happening. So um, to conclude here, what we've done is we provided these two calibrated records of the EDI and Cambrian boundary, um, the integrate sedimentology biostratigraphy and chemostratigraphy with high precision uranium lead geochronology. So in Mexico, there's this negative carbon isotope anomaly um, that uh, uh, we correlate and others have correlated to the base. Uh, it's younger than 539.4 million years old and it appears to coincide with biotic turnover. In South Africa, limestones of the Nama group were deposited with relatively continuous and high rates of sedimentation from about 539.8 million years ago to 538.0 million years ago. But they don't preserve a negative carbon isotope excursion that can be correlated to the base. Ediacaran type fossils occur in the Namstas formation after 538.5 million years ago, and uh, including uh, Erniatomorphs and Claudinomorphs. And these stratigraphic thickly overlap with the relatively complex bioterian um, trace fossils, things like Archaeonasa and, and uh, Parasamachnides, um, these you know, clear, clear bioterian behaviors, but importantly, not Triptychnus pedum. So we can't actually identify the base of the Cambrian from its current biostratigraphic de definition. So I think it remains possible that the uh, FAD of Triptychnus pedum is younger than 537.9 uh, million years old. And it's possible that the EDIAC and Cambrian boundary, um, given both the chemostratigraphy and the biostratigraphy, is younger than 538 million years old. Um, and 
I think you know that could get quite a bit younger. So more geochronology is really necessary to test the global synchronicity of these changes. Um, so I think I have five minutes left. So in the remaining time, I just want to uh, briefly get back to, to some of the regional geology of the NAMA group um, and, and look a little bit more closely at these data sets. Um, uh, the integrated stratigraphy and geochronology. Um, so in addition to these uh, ash beds down in along the Orange River on the Night Navajo Plateau that we dated, uh, we dated a couple ash beds from the uh, lower part of the Schwarzerrand subgroup um, in Namibia. And these are the, the dates plotted here, these histograms, um, the weighted mean ages. And so about 545 MA is, is the lower one. I'm right at the top of the very, very base of the Schwarzerrand subgroup. Um, and then this higher one in the uh, in, within the lower part of the Schwarzerrand subgroup, but still a classic dominated interval, um, is about 543 MA. And we can also take this age from the Quivis subgroup, from uh, the Zara subbasin that was uh, um, uh, originally dated in the Grotzinger 95 paper and then uh, redated with chemical abrasion and Bowering et al. 2007. And we can um, you know, apply the chemostratigraphic and, and lithostratigraphic correlations into, into the section from the Nainabu Plateau. And we can get this age stratigraphic um, per, uh, de depth model, Bayesian depth model, using the same process for the entire NAMA group. And really the important thing to highlight here is that there's this big acceleration in sediment accumulation rates. So the sedimentation rates in the lower part of the NAMA are quite low. And then in the upper part of the NAMA, they get really high. So there's this acceleration. And that's consistent with, with how we understand Foreland basins to work. So Foreland basins tend to have this, uh, this accelerated um, sediment accumulation rate that's, that's due to lithos increasing lithospheric uh, uh, flexure as, you, um, as, as your, your origin move, moves forward. OK, so um, I want to look at this in the framework of, of uh, diagenic alteration. So Anne-Sophie Aim and Clara Blotler and, and John Higgins and many of their other colleagues have been doing work on um, recent and ancient sediments to try to understand diagenetic history of carbonates. And these are through both modeling and field studies. And through these studies, they've demonstrated the utility of um, strontium to calcium ratios, as well as calcium isotopes to constrain the diagenesis of carbonate rocks. So what they show is that carbonates that have uh, experienced sediment buffered um, diagenic regimes have very distinctive fingerprints um, using these proxies than sediments that have uh, experienced fluid buffered diagenic regimes. So if we take a look at previously generated data sets from the NAMA group um, from Tostevin and Wood um, within this framework and think about the context of acceleration of sedimentation rate in the NAMA group um, that, that, that we've recently recognized, what we can see is the upper NAMA um, with the fast sedimentation rates look sediment buffered. So these units in the upper NAMA have low calcium isotope values and, and lots of strontium. Whereas the units in the basal NAMA have with, that have much lower sediment accumulation rates look seawater buffered. Um, so we see the stratigraphic shift in the calcium isotope values moving up section. We see these increases in the strontium concentrations um, and then there are the, all these other geochemical proxies that I think could be reacting to these processes as well. So you get this increase in pyrite sulfur isotope values. So these are these so-called super heavy um, pyrite values. Um, these seem to correlate with the uh, increase in sedimentation rate. Uh, in addition, you get this decrease in uranium isotope values, um, which has been uh, attributed to expanding uh, global anoxia. And so for uranium isotopes, sediment buffered conditions with fast sedimentation rates are likely to preserve primary seawater values. So maybe this anoxic type signal. But if you have low sedimentation rates, you can get uh, artificially high uranium isotope values because of um, poor water reduction of uranium um, from seawater. So I just think it's, uh, it'll be important moving forward to, to think about some of these processes um, and how they could react to these uh, documented changes in sediment accumulation rates. A caveat here is of course that I think the, the, the correlation here, this is the Zara subbasin down here. Uh, this is the Whitput subbasin up here um, in our Orange River data. And so stitching together here, um, I, I think uh, is probably correct based on the lithostratigraphic correlations, um, but this could change a little bit. Um, 
Another important caveat to these age depth models is that I haven't done any backstripping here. Um, so I haven't taken into account any uh, of the differential compaction between siliciclastic and carbonate sediments. But what that'll do is they'll actually just increase these changes because uh, siliciclastic sediments uh, compact more. So it'll make the sedimentation rates of the lower NAMA um, even lower. So a lot of different geochemical proxies have been observed to vary from the lower to the upper NAMA group. Um, and these changes have been interpreted as changes in basin redox or nutrient structure. And this may indeed be the correct interpretation. Um, this is certainly possible. Um, but something important is that uh, many of these proxies, including iron speciation or chemical index of alteration, um, et cetera, can, can be significantly influenced by sedimentation rates. And what we show here is this order and magnitude increase in sedimentation rates from the lower NAMA to the upper NAMA. So I think this is another potential factor that, that just needs to be considered um, going forward and in, in interpreting the geochemistry of these units. I think I'm out of time now. Um, so thanks so much for, for uh, your time this morning and or, or wherever you, your time zone is. And um, I just put the, uh, the um, screenshot of our recent publication up here in case you want more detailed information, I'd, I'd direct you there. And, and I'm happy to take any questions at their time. Great job, Lyle. Um, we will transition to our more, uh, our discussion and questions. We're gonna start with people who have questions that are going to be applicable to the broad audience. Again, if you have some more specific questions or that you think might be better for a discussion or chat session, we'll save that for a while, uh, for a little bit here, and then you can talk with Toa a while at the end. Um, we'll give some people time to type up their questions. Uh, if anybody has anything now, go ahead and raise your hand. Or, okay, Fred Boyer is ready to ask a question. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. Really enjoyed that and enjoyed seeing the photographs and very much enjoyed your paper as well. Um, um, I guess I've, I've actually got loads of questions, so I'll probably go on asking questions throughout the session. But um, I guess one of them, uh, I completely agree with you for one thing about the, the late base. I, 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 my personal opinion is that it's later than 538. So I, I think that if had your paper come out uh, like a month earlier, I probably would have stripped away the models A and B from our correlation paper and just left it with model C because I think that's the most reliable, mo most reasonable um, age for the base as well. And I completely agree also that the Fortunian radioisotopic record is is very loose. So actually, we haven't got very much control on that um, at all. But I guess my question, um, first of all, would be uh, about sedimentation rates. So picking up on your last um, your last comment. Um, how I, I, I saw from your regional correlation that you're interpreting the 540 age as far points to be a maximum depositional age. But it's also, I suppose, equally possible that it's just slower accumulation rates at spark point than Orange River, in which case, actually, the, the accumulation rates themselves are not very different between the Cubist and Schwarz transfer groups for the calcium and other data that we've got for this. Uh, I was wondering if you'd, you'd be willing to talk about, about a little bit more your interpretation of the MDA age. Yeah, I have, um, uh, I don't have a lot of comment. You know, I think there's uh, geochronologists that are working on this and and this will be resolved in uh, the forthcoming year. I think it's really important. I, th I think for me with like the, the uh, you know, unit for unit correlate, lithostratigraphic correlation, basically that we can do from Swart Punt to the Orange River, um, it's really hard to make that diachronous at that scale. It's possible. So I like, I totally, I think that's a huge caveat, you know, and I have, and none of that's published. I just wanted to kind of bring it up as a point that, you know, if this is the case, which, you know, is, is what, if I just use the current existing age constraints as, as we understand them, um, th this is an important shift happening in the NAMI group and, and something that shouldn't, shouldn't be unexpected given, uh, the tectonic setting really. Yeah. Um, and, but I, I, I think that, you know, I think more geochronology is gonna have to come from uh, the Swart Pun area to, to, to test that. And especially from like the Huns, um, because we get, you know, we get a really young age for the Huns and that's, that's, that's pinning the sedimentation rate. So I think verifying that um, is gonna yeah. be really important. I totally agree. <laughs> I think that's just, you know, this is where the data is at and, and 
maybe more data will will change that and and des destroy any concept of the change in sedimentation rate. I think if that's the case, then something that's comes out that's really if you know if there is that level of diachroneity along the margin, it's really important that biostratigraphers, uh, biostratigraphers, and and chemostratigraphers, and all these the people aren't uh, tying occurrences from one section to age models from other sections. So that becomes the, the big thing to be careful of, because that's what people do a lot right now. Right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the question. And yeah, I loved your paper. All right. We have a few in the uh, in the chat here. So Greg Vitalik asks, could the negative excursion be from meteoric weathering of carbonate during the low sea level stand? Uh, I don't think that the that's a good question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, different geochemical proxies have to be used to investigate um, potential diagenetic controls, but there generally there's no oxygen carbon correlation um, in any of these uh, excursions. And that's generally what you expect from uh, meteoric diagenesis is my understanding. So that's, that's my answer. All right, we've got a couple more and then we've got David and Paul, but Max Lester says, great talk Lyle. Some amazing field sites. What is the depth range of T pedum? The could the could the Namtas formation be too deep? The pinnacle reef looks really cool. Could some of the oscillates in the Namtas formation be alachthonous blocks falling from a reef escarpment? Are they are they composed of reef bases? Um, okay, so start with the first question the, um, about the, the depth dependence of Triptychus pedum. I think that's certainly possible. Uh, uh, Louis Patois had a paper arguing that there isn't a big facies dependence um, a, a few years ago based on work in the Van Rinsdorp subbasin on, on Triptychus pedum. Um, and that basically has a wide um, uh, depth and environmental range. Um, we also do see like, like I showed those photos of these things that we think might be Samachnites, these bi uh, bilobate fossils, these really large um, uh, other trace fossils. And, and so that there, are, there is a extensive trace fossil record generally in the non -stoss. So I'm not sure why you would preserve a bunch of other traces and not, um, not triptychus pedum, but, but you might, that totally could be the answer. I, uh, I don't have strong opinions on that. Okay. And then and the, the additional question was about uh, listoliths, I think. And so, yeah, the listoliths generally look like they're from the Spitzkopf member, lower down, not actually reef material. So it tends to be these bedded carbonates. Okay. Was that Thanks. all? Great talk, Lyle. Yeah. Thanks, Max. All right. The next question is from Tara Giles. Great presentation, Lyle. Do you think that your local platform conclusion for the base has any implications for the EDAC and Shurim carbon isotope excursion? Um, you know, I, I think that ultimately that's not my preferred interpretation is the local platform excursion. I think my preferred interpretation is, is the, um, the excursion is younger um, and that uh, some of the geochronology from these other sections need to be revisited. But I, I don't want to get into the can of worms of the Sherum excursion. I haven't uh, worked in detail on it. And I think, you know, I, um, James Bush recently had a really nice paper looking at um, some other other isotopic proxies and discussing the origin of this. There's been a lot of work in the last few years. So uh, yeah, I'm not gonna comment on that. Okay, David Evans is up next. Hey Lyle, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic presentation, great work. Um, so my question is a broad one for consideration for the entire group, but Lyle, I'd love to hear your comments first, um, which is that it's my understanding that, that GSSP definition can be reconsidered after some number of years um, if it's determined that this is just there's better sections around um, and it seems increasingly like the the Newfoundland GSSP for the base of the Cambrian is only suitable to the extent that it can it the TPDM can be found somewhere else and then there's all these other considerations so I was just wondering and we have enough people here um, <clears throat> we might want to start thinking about well um, we've got these beautiful sections that are being really well constrained in other places of the world. Why not reconsider um, defining in a way that will be less ambiguous? Yeah, I think, um, you know, personally, I, I think, I think 
you know, a lot of this comes down to technology and, and what people consider to be complex enough to define as the first complex bilaterium um, and, or, or complex bilaterium behavior. And, and, you know, there's been these uh, publications on things like parasamicnides and, and um, triptychnids that occur slightly lower in the NAMA group. Um, and yeah, which of these is considered or whether we want to move it to a more unambiguous body fossil, I think is totally appropriate. Um, chemostratigraphy marker, I think some people have recently suggested that. I think that is going to require some more control. There's been a lot of people questioning the fidelity of these records recently. And so I think we should wait on that at least until there's some agreement on that. Um, per, again, personally, I have no problem with tryptomycin. I just think it might be quite a bit young. like if you look globally at how well uh, age controls for tryptomycin. It's not very well constrained. I think the best is from uh, Siberia, and it's uh, it's quite a bit younger. Um, so uh, it depends. You know, uh, I think there there are groups that have argued that it shows up in in the um, upper part of the Nama um, at at Swart Pun actually. But I think a lot of ecologists disagree with that classification. Um, and then where it actually shows up in the NAMA for sure is in the NAMSAS formation. But importantly, NAMSAS formation uh, outcrops that are hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away from where the dated NAMSAS formation is. And so the ability to correlate these, the infill of these incised valleys across hundreds of kilometers in an active Berlin basin is. You know, I think we need to be careful there. Um, so, so, anyways, Tibeta might be fine, but it might just be quite a bit younger. So it's just how. Anyways, I yeah, I just think, uh, yeah, I, I would be happy to hear other people's perspective on this. That's a great question. All right, Paula's ready next. Was that me? Yeah, Paul Hoffman. Sorry. Right. Uh, yeah. Wonderful talk, Lyle. Great work. Um, this is more a comment than a question. Um, <clears throat> I think it's possible to overstate uh, Darwin's dilemma as viewed by Darwin himself. When, when you read Darwin, not just The Origin, but his many other books and papers, uh, two things become apparent. Uh, the first is that he had a really, a, a rather flexible view of evolution. And secondly, uh, he was in the habit of using as a rhetorical ploy, as a means of disarming um, criticism in advance by introducing an argument uh, as follows. Um, if you don't believe such and such, you're not going to accept anything that I have to say. And I think his comment about, uh, about the, the Cambrian uh, explosion or whatever uh, falls into this category. It was sort of a rhetorical ploy uh, he used to disarm criticism in advance. Um, I, I think that um, it's possible that he didn't uh, uh, view the sudden appearance of complex animals as a, a quite a, so problematic as you might think. Yeah, and I think what I, tried, what I tried to say after that was that he thought that eventually a record would be found that, that traced these groups lower too, is, is my understanding from... Uh, Any uh, more outliers to the south? Yeah, there's lots. Good. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Okay, I've got one in the chat here from Kaysender Sarwan. Greetings and thank you, sir. Where were there any present? Were, were there any presence of a transition of the complexity of trace fossils from seemingly random movement to optimized patterns, such as consecutive parallel patterns? And if so, what are the ramifications for later events like the Cambrian agronomic revolution? So I think there's uh, certainly an a increase in complexity there. The, the more complex forms are, are higher up in the, um, in the Spitzkopf member and the Namsas formation, whereas um, simpler fossils are, are lower in the section. Uh, I would point you to, to work by folks such as Allison Cribb and um, Simon Derrick on, on uh, um, Louis Petrois, many others on the NAMA group that have really uh, well documented, um, and from not not from these sections, but from other sections that are probably correlative. Some of these uh, changes in in burrowing behavior. So I, I would point you to those papers. Um, 
Zoran Jensen, yeah, many, 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 many great papers on, on this topic. And what we really do is try to provide the, you know, stratigraphic um, basin framework for, the, for this. Okay, next up is from Hedda Adjik. Hi, Nelson. Uh, this, is a, this is a great point. Your paper. Um, so my, my question is, um, it's, it's a little bit more specific, so I'm, I'm really so, sorry, Alex, if, uh, if you wanted to move on more specific questions or not. Uh, so, my, so my question is, did you see any, um, did, did you also measure organic carbon isotopes um, connected with a positive carbon isotope excursion in the siliciclastics, or are all those siliciclastics um, very organic matter poor? Um, too poor to get the isotopes, maybe. Yeah, so for the NAMA group, um, at least surface outcrops, very, very lean. Uh, probably too lean to, to trust any organic carbon isotopes. There, there's a project going on right now to, to drill parts of the NAMA group. Um, and there, you know, there's possibility that some of the leanness is from um, oxidative weathering that's, that's more recent due to the long-term exposure of Kalahari Craton post um, opening of the Atlantic and uplift. But um, I, yeah, I, I think we're not really sure whether that's, it's a, however, you know, I think that the, the oil companies in Namibia have been uh, working on, on the NAMA for, they, they did a lot of work on the NAMA um, uh, decades ago. And, and I think their general finding was everything was very, very lean. Um, and at least for the surface outcrops uh, in, Southwest North America, same case. Thank you. So it would be great, but I think it's difficult. Okay, thanks for fielding all the questions right there, Lyle. It, I'm not seeing anything else as far as hands or anything in the uh, in the chat. So we'll go ahead. And I'm going to stop the recording and we'll open the floor just for people to chat. Um, anything you want to chat about or talk about directly with Lyle, we can start some conversation, so. Super, thanks so much, Alex.